Welcome, everybody, to the Live Ultralight podcast powered by Outdoor Vitals. This podcast is all about inspiring you to get outdoors, showing you how to lighten your pack and build your confidence so you can start living your life full of adventure. I am Joe, and I'm here today with a friend of mine, uh, Lalanya Ghosh, uh, who is the host of a little podcast called The Schoolie Diaries. And this is a bit unusual uh, as far as episodes are concerned because uh, – we do we do dabble in travel here at Outdoor Vitals just a little bit. We have a we have a travel pack that's coming out soon that was kickstarted a few months ago called Dakota UL. Well. Um, and so I figured uh, I would uh, I would broaden it a little bit more. There's a lot of overlap between people who are interested in backpacking uh, and people who are interested in travel, and especially this type of travel. It's almost like instead of lightening your pack, you're actually lightening your entire life in order to do what Lelania does. So uh, this is going to be all about what it's like to live in a school bus, a renovated school bus, and travel around the U.S. Uh, so Lelania, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This is really <laughs> exciting. Hashtag um, bus life. Hashtag bus life. <laughs> hashtag van. <laughs> I was so obsessed with this. So I've, uh, I've known mm. you for a while. And I knew when you guys were doing this, you guys were like renovating this, this stuff. And I was following along with the, with the podcast that you guys were putting out. And I was so jealous. I was living in, a, <laughs> I was, I was living in a crappy apartment in Los Angeles and, uh, I was, I was broke and all I was thinking about was like, oh man, wouldn't it be great if I could just get a van and go travel and like be outside of where I am right now um, and be able to go all hiking and, and all this other stuff just by like driving to the location. Maybe I can, I remember I was thinking like ways of working remotely, like maybe I could teach English online or something like that. Uh, so, so deeply jealous of it. And I did eventually of course have an experience of being able to live in my car for three months uh which was a great experience uh we won't delve too much into what i've i've done but i was like obsessed with van life and, and bus life there's a lot of overlap and uh i was just watching tons of youtube videos about how people were doing it or where people were going when they were uh out there uh very cool to me uh the lifestyle so tell me when did you come across this stuff this lifestyle Oh, it was a long time ago. I can't even remember exactly when. I know I was kind of obsessed with the tumbleweed tiny homes, which are basically actual wooden homes built on travel trailers. Mm -hmm. But they cost like $50,000 probably 10 years ago. And then you'd have to buy a car to actually pull it. So it was just kind of a dream that I knew I was never going to realize. And then I saw a blog by a college student who was an architect major. And for his thesis, he built a school bus. It was Hank bought a bus and he did it for $10,000. And I was like, we can do this. Oh, he built a house out of a school bus? Well, so he, built a, he built a schoolie, essentially. It, okay. it lacked a lot of the niceties, but he did travel the country in it. And it was very inspiring to see him do that. I'm like, well, we can do that. <laughs> so how, uh, like how long from the germination of this idea to you guys actually purchasing a bus? Several years. My husband, ironically, was not on board with it. <laughs> um, it, it. I just kept bringing it up and bringing it up and bringing it up and bringing it up some more. And eventually, as he normally does, he just one day went, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. What would it take to do this? How much would it cost? Give me you know, a budget and what you think it's going to take and how long you think it's going to take and let's go ahead and do it. And, and I got real excited. <laughs> and you guys are from New Hampshire, right? Yes. Yeah. And we're you based out of New Hampshire. And how long were you living in that house in New Hampshire? Oh, that's a good question. Let's see. We've been traveling for two years, 12 years. Okay. All right. So you spent a good amount of time in a, in a solid home. Oh, yeah. 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 We were <laughs> home. I've probably lived in that house longer than I've lived in any single location in my life. Was it? What, what, what to you more, what was it kind of that, was it the, was it the traveling that excited you or was it the idea of like simplifying your life, at least in terms of materials? 
Oh, travel. 100% travel. it was travel. <laughs> there, like, there's so much Means I want to see in the world. Yeah. And yeah. It, well, it had everything I wanted. I love going and seeing new places. I hate staying in hotel rooms or anywhere, really. I can't sleep in a new place for a couple of days. Hmm. So every time we go somewhere, like when we went to Japan one year, we were there for seven days. And I think I couldn't sleep for four of those days very well. And it always ruins a vacation. And then you got to find a place for the dog to stay. You've got to get somebody to take care of the cat for you. If it's during the winter, you have to have somebody come and check on your pipes to make sure those haven't blown up. You know, there's all this other stuff that's involved. It's very expensive. But with a school bus or any type of RV, trailer, van, you have your whole house with you. So the cat's here, the dog's here. And I'm comfortable in this space. I've never had a problem sleeping in this bedroom. You know, I'm very familiar with it. So we just mm -hmm. take our whole little house with us. And it's Thank great. Uh, so tell us about the, the whole process of renovating the, uh, the bus. Where did you, uh, why a bus and not a van? I'm also curious about that. A van isn't big enough for us. Okay. Just, you know, if I were 20 and single, I might be able to do a van, <laughs> but I'm 40 and married. What about a Chevy Avejo? Ah, <laughs> oh, I'm not quite sure how big that is. <laughs> That's tiny. That's teeny, tiny. <laughs> very, very tiny. I had a, uh, a mini I had smaller a, though. So I had a junior mattress. Luckily, I'm a short guy. I had a junior mattress that was like diagonally laid in the back. Oh. <laughs> on the back it would seats. have to be, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I hate what you're gonna do. Yeah. But let me see. The process is fairly involved. Now, I was very particular. I did a lot of research. I'm very much a research-oriented person. I did not go into this blind. I knew what I was getting into well ahead of time. I was well aware. No major surprises. I was very picky about the engine transmission combination I wanted and all of that. And I chose a bus because it gave us a very, very strong, very robust platform. They're relatively cheap to acquire, even with the price increase due to its popularity, it's still much cheaper than a comparable RV would be. And it's built 10 times stronger than an RV. 100% these things are really, really, really robust. Hmm. So that's why we chose that, you know, I had the space we wanted for the price we wanted and customization was a huge draw as well. I can build this any way I need to, you know, it, it's all up to the individual. Do you want more couch space? Do you want more storage space? Do you want a big bedroom or a small bedroom shower or no shower? You, you get to make your own choices. And usually with RVs, unless you got the thing and start over, you can't do that. Right. Yeah. You'd have to gut the RV. Uh, and those, those things are not, um, they aren't, yeah, they're not robust at all, uh, famously. No, they are so. not well built. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it. There are a few. The Airstream's pretty good. Um, an old Wander Lodge is really good, but then a Wander Lodge is built on a bus chassis. So there you go. Have you ever seen the movie Lost in America? I don't think so. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a great movie, great comedy from the 1980s where a couple like sells everything they have and, uh, and quits their jobs and and takes that a, sounds uh, like a movie i takes should an, watch takes an rv across and of course it doesn't go well but <laughs> they take an <laughs> rv from la they get stuck they get stuck in vegas uh something horrible happens and then they they have to deal with the consequences it's really oh. really great movie um yeah i've got those stories <laughs> <laughs> uh so tell us about yeah the re the renovation process like i've i've been through the bus it's pretty spectacular Oh, well, thank you. I, I don't consider this to be one of the high end builds, very much mid range, but you know, it's robust. It's simple, simple and strong. <sighs> the process. How long did it take? So it took me six months of way too hard work. I, I, I overworked myself making this bus. Oh my God. I really should have given myself more time. I, man, my knees are never going to be the same. Uh. Um, we purchased the bus from a place in Virginia. We had somebody source it for us. A bus conversion company did that for us because we didn't want a New Hampshire bus that was salted to death. And it rear engines are very rare in New Hampshire. You don't see them very often. So we had them buy the bus for us. They gutted it for us, which is like two months right off the bat. They did the rust abatement on the floor for us. That means you tear the entire floor out down to the metal because there will be rust under there almost inevitably. 
every once in a while you get lucky, but you have to take it all the way down to the metal, fix any holes that are in it, seal the whole thing back up, and then you can put your insulation and flooring on top of that. So we had them do that for us and we had them build the frames for the walls because we have a bathroom and we have a shower and they're on separate sides of the bus. So there's a hallway in the middle and we had them build the frames for those because I can't frame to save my life. I've tried, it's a disaster. After that, we drove down to North Carolina where they had their workshop. And then we took us four days to drive back. And from there, it was mostly planning. We took, I had already figured out a basic layout on graph paper. You know, I cut out little pieces for the furniture that I thought we would need and I placed it all out and we had a pretty solid layout to begin with. It's very simple, very basic. I, I didn't get fancy with it. There are no L countertops or anything like that. Just a central hallway, bedroom, bathroom, shower, kitchen, desk, living room area. Very basic, very easy. Didn't change it a lot. When we had the flooring um, empty, when there was nothing in the bus, we actually took out some painter's tape and we laid down where we thought everything would be in the bus to get an idea of the sizing of things how wide a hallway needs to be, you know, things like that to figure out what kind of space we're working with. And from there, it was just a lot of putting things together. You have to take it one day at a time. If you look at the entire project, it's very easy to get overwhelmed. So you kind of have to take it one day at a time. The very first thing you need to do, though, is seal up your roof. Because if you've got leaks in your roof, you've got leaks in everything. And that was a nightmare. The roof was pretty solid, but the windows, oh my God, the windows, so many leaks in the windows. <laughs> Resealed all the windows. I would take the hose and spray the windows up down sideways to try to figure out where any holes were. Where the leaks were, yeah. Oh, where all the leaks are. They still leak, but not on the outside. They leak where the gasket holds the window itself into the frame. And that's just old gaskets and I'm not gonna replace them all. So you just patch them when, you, when appropriate and leave it be. Cause these are all original windows. I did not replace any of the windows. We skinned two. So two were removed and covered over with metal so that I could put it in the shower. Hmm. I probably would have skinned a couple more if I'd known they would never get used, but hindsight. <laughs> we weren't exactly sure where things were gonna go at the time. So yeah, and from there, it's just a lot of, a lot of woodwork. A lot of woodwork. I learned how to build cabinets. My mom taught me. So I put in everything in here is custom built, custom cabinets with the drawers, the bed frame, you know, it's all custom stuff. And a lot of it is, again, a lot of research and planning, a lot of trying to figure out what are you going to use the bus for? What does your life look like? Do you like to read and play video games and go hiking every once in a while? Well, then you're gonna want a couch. You're gonna want a very comfortable inside somewhere where you can lay a lot, you know, and maybe somewhere to pack some stuff for hiking. Um, I see a lot of people do very inspirational builds where they think, well, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna do all the hiking and I'm gonna cook everything and we're never gonna stay in the house. We're just never gonna be in here. And they build like, for a family of four, there's a love seat. <laughs> Are you sure that's what you want to do? <laughs> so part of it is build it to your life as is, not the life you hope you have. Because if you know anything from New Year's resolutions, you almost never get to the life you really are aspiring to. So that's what we did. We have a big couch. We have a large desk that can double as kitchen space if needed. But we had to have a place where Siobhan could work. We had to have a place where the dog can sit. We had to have a place where we could lay on a rainy day where everybody was comfortable, you know? So we've got the couch and all four of us can fit on the couch. Um, another big thing was two forms of heat because you never know what's gonna happen. Always two forms of heat. <laughs> never rely on just electrical, never rely on just a diesel heater. Like something can break, always have auxiliary forms of heat. So what do you have? Anything else? <laughs> oh, we have a wood stove. We have a diesel heater. We actually do have a heat pump. So we have, and we do have like an electrical space heater. So technically we have four. There you go. <laughs> so you'll never be cold. Well, yeah, yeah, we're never cold. Um, 
California is a little weird though. We couldn't use the wood stove in California mm -hmm. in any of the cities or towns. They will freak right out if you use a wood stove. They just lose their minds about it. So it was pretty much just diesel heater. We use the diesel heater way more often than I thought we would. I got it as an auxiliary form of heat just in case we needed it and we use it all the time. So, so much so that I need to replace it and get a bigger gas tank. <laughs> So I, uh, I do want to recommend your podcast again, the Schoolie Diaries. Um, how do you spell Schoolie? It's like S K O O L I E, right? Bang yeah. on. All right, the Schoolie Diaries, where you can listen to like week by week as you guys were making the bus. Very in depth. Very in depth. <laughs> Which is funny because like that was super in depth, but you guys, once you actually hit the road, we get like once a month, we get like a travel update. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've, I've literally have the recordings for the next one. And I really need to do it. I just haven't. I hate <laughs> editing them. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. You don't need to edit. So I hate <laughs> editing. I don't know. Well, there's the editing and then there's uploading. So sometimes we don't always have internet. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's I have no excuse right now. <laughs> um, well, tell us. So I, you started in New Hampshire. Where did you go from there? Oh, goodness. So we started in February of 2020, right before COVID hit. So we started going down the East Coast. Shavam had a customer in New York we had to see. There's actually an RV park right in just outside of New York City, where you can sit there and look right at the Statue of Liberty. It's oh, right wow. there. It's crazy. Had to drive through New Jersey, though, which was horrifying. Oof, that was rough. Um, no we comment. went there. <laughs> Yeah, it was bad. It was really bad. I thought the bus was going to fall apart. It was terrible. So much anxiety. <laughs> we went down, mostly down the East Coast. We were planning to get to, first of all, we were running from the cold because February, we had gotten very lucky. Our winter was very mild and not a lot of snow, which was great when you're converting. And then we were booking it as far south as we could get, as fast as we could go. And then COVID hit and everything shut down and we got stuck in, I think it was North Carolina, just outside of Charlotte. And we were there for six weeks. And then we had to go home because Shavam's father got COVID. So then it was May and we booked it all the way back up again. And mm -hmm. then from there, we went to New York and saw the Finger Lakes, which are as beautiful as people tell you. I was not prepared for it to be that pretty. We did Niagara Falls. And we stayed there for a couple of weeks and we went and we visited where Shavam was um, raised, which was Iowa. We went to Illinois where I had grown up and basically followed the Mississippi down. We Thanksgiving on the coast in Biloxi, Mississippi. And then we proceeded to make our way through Louisiana. I had never been to Louisiana. We went to New Orleans. I got to see the bayou and all of that. Great food, by the way great food. The, the less you can understand the person talking, the better the food gets. <laughs> and we could understand about 25% of what everybody said. We're like, this food's going to be amazing. And it you was. Don't, you don't know so any good. French? Mm. No. Uh, je m'appelle l'aigne enchanté. <laughs> en deux, trois. There we go. That's go. it. <laughs> Doesn't get you far. Um, and then we went to Texas. I had never been to Texas before in my life. We stayed in Houston for a couple of months and then parted around Texas. Texas is huge. Parted around there for a while, got caught in the ice storm. Yay. And then Luckily, you had four started... forms of heat. Yeah, well, then we had three. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that wood stove and diesel heater, man, they kept us alive because electricity was... Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that was rough. We felt yeah. really bad because we were in a better place than most Texans were at that point. Yeah, you're just, just not like, ready for I that mean, kind of thing down there, huh? We can burn stuff. Yeah, yeah they're not prepared for that at all. Not to mention, you know, usually the heat pumps that they have, a lot of them are older and they can't go that low. Even if they had heat, it's just, it was rough. It was rough. And then we ended our Texas tour in Big Bend National Park, which is where we got our America the Beautiful passes for that year which are still good. What are those? And what are those America, the beautiful passes? What are... You pay $80 and it is good for, 
I think you're a car or a family essentially. And those are good for a year to get you in any national park. Any, oh, okay, you yeah. get some discounts on campgrounds, I think, or no, I think it's just the entry fee, but it gives you access to all national parks, um, national forests, any national recreation areas and lands. It gives you a pass to, you just get in for free, you wave your little card and you're good to go, which paid for itself. Cause I think we've gone to like 12 national parks and monuments in the last year. Nice. I just, yeah. I just talked to a guy on this show, um, would have been, I guess, two weeks before this episode comes out. Uh, it was a guy who's been to like 40 something national parks. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, 12 is a lot. That's but... a lot. <laughs> 12 is a lot in like a I've, year. I think I've been to very 10. small. Yeah. Yeah. We've been to some of the larger parks, but we've also been to a lot of little things that we just didn't even know until we searched the area. We're like, oh, like, this is over here. You want to go see it? The, the, there's a golden spike over here. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's go to the golden spike. Why not? You have the pass. I've never when you once have been that to that pass, golden spike. <laughs> you go to everything. It was actually really cool. We got to see the trains leave and then they came back in. It was really oh, cool. Nice, it sounds nice. just like the movies. It yeah. sounds just like the movie. I, uh, which is so cool. My parents don't live that far from it. I mean, relatively, it's not that far. And I just will, I've never gone. I've never gone once. It's like out of the way. It's kind of out there. But it, it really is. But we were just kind of in the area. So we're like, why not? Yeah, why not? And there's like a company that makes rockets for, I don't know if it's, I think it's mostly the military and partially NASA, but a lot of them are like military rockets. And we just passed that. We had no idea it was there. We just went home a different way. And there's just this big building and then a bunch of rocket pieces out front. So of course we stopped there and walked through the stuff. And that was really cool too. I mean, sometimes you just don't know what's out there until you go out there. Oh, and wow. that's not far from the golden spike. That was really cool. There's the Hill Air Force Base. That's a pretty cool, cool, uh, area to go through it might have been that you know i have no idea i'd have to i'd have to go back it's more than just rockets at the at the hill air force base it's like like a huge oh, airplane museum basically yeah there was somewhere that had that was in albuquerque i think the nuclear museum that they had there they had all kinds of weird stuff that like carried nuclear weapons and things like that that it's, was really cool too it's fun to live vicariously through you guys as you guys <laughs> <laughs> clearly, clearly go through like the what is that app? What is that website? Is Atlas Obscura? I think. Oh, we totally do Atlas Obscura. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. That's yeah. like one of the first things Shavam checks when we go to a new place. Is, <laughs> is there anything for Atlas Obscura here? And we've been to some Atlas Obscura stuff, and some of it's cool. Some of it's eh. some of it's really cool. Like I think there was a snake museum in oh gosh, it was somewhere in New Mexico. Can't remember now. But we went to a snake museum there, and that was really cool. I was super hyped up for that. Of course, we have a magnet for it because we have a magnet for everything. Well, after Texas, where did you go? Texas, yeah. That, then it was New Mexico. I had never been to Roswell. Um, so we went to Roswell, and I stayed there for two weeks, I think, because Shavam had to go see his mom. And uh, there's not really much out there in Roswell. Not really worth the week. The museum's kind of cool, and then it's just, an entire week flat desert with lots of dairy see now you say roswell <laughs> and i think people in rvs i immediately think there's a huge amount of people in rvs <laughs> there, i mean there are a few I but have actually that not as many head. yeah oh that's interesting yeah it's yeah well you don't know until you go you know it, it's something it's a place that we both wanted to go the museum is really cool i highly recommend going to the museum that's really interesting but then the town's just like eh. So I wouldn't stay too long. Albuquerque is really lovely. So we did go to Albuquerque and then we went to, gosh, I have to remember now, Arizona. We went to Arizona, saw the petrified forest, and then we stayed in Flagstaff for like two weeks, I think, which is beautiful in the summer. Hit White Sands, saw Cloudcroft, which is like this little town way up on a mountain. And when it was like 90 degrees at the bottom of the mountain, it was like 65 in Cloudcroft. It was great. Nice. Oh, it felt so good to be up there because it was so hot. <laughs> and then we came up your way and we were in Salt Lake City for two months. A long time. And then we went, yeah, well, 
we were here for running that game for you guys. Yeah, so. yeah, that's right. Thank you guys. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, we it played was a uh, lot of fun. Played like a like a custom uh, RPG or, or Dungeons and Dragons sort of a thing for those at home that are very confused. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <it> was, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lalania's husband. Uh, sorry, I did the wrong A on that name. That's, we, so we, that name. we call you a different nickname uh, off the show, but uh, <laughs> uh, your husband set up this uh, campaign that was all um, it was like Fallout themed, and it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I, I've never played a, an RPG campaign that long before. I've gone like really, yeah, I've gone like wow. Three, I guess I've I've done them on podcasts. I've done a couple sessions, and that's that's about it. They're always fun for me, but I never have been able to like have like a solid group that like keeps on going. So. Yeah, it's it's a big commitment. It's kind of the big complaint everybody in the table RPG group has is trying to get a <laughs> bunch of adults together to play those games. Like it was so easy when we were in high school, you know. Yeah, I'm kind of mad I never played it in high school. I had I guess I had like friends of friends who played it. I always looked at them like they were the super nerds. Like I wasn't one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now it's like, you yeah, yeah. but Henry Cavill likes them too. Oh yeah, it, it got therefore it got mainstream, which is awesome. In its own it's way. Cool. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I never really cared. Like, um, I don't care if it's cool or not. I like it. Where where did you where have you gone since then? I know you guys went to California. We went to Yellowstone because okay. I'd never been there. We spent a week. At Yellowstone, it was not long enough. I definitely want to go back to Yellowstone. No, there's a million especially things to, paint to see. It. Yeah, well, we were yeah. also there during like the fires, so a lot of the smoke was in the area. So when we went to see the Grand Tetons, it was more like the Grand Smoke Tons. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so eh. we were actually there, I think, two weeks before Gabby Petito, I believe. Mm. So that was always interesting. And then we went through um, Oregon. And then up through Washington. So I saw Spokane. And then we stopped in Seattle, which, wow, it rains a lot in Seattle. Holy moly. <laughs> That's what they tell me. <laughs> oh, apparently it's from like September until May is the rainy season. <laughs> it's like, oh, goodness. That's a long rainy season. And then we basically just went down the coast. We went down the Oregon coast, which is absolutely beautiful. I mean, if you haven't been to the Oregon coast, you need to go. It's I really not, gorgeous. I have not been to Washington or Oregon. And someday. yeah, the coasts are really beautiful. Did you go down the PCT in California or did you go through the middle of California? We mostly stayed to the coastal area. We did not take uh, Route 1. Oh, that's what I mean. I, I said wanted PCT. To do. That's the Pacific Crest Trail, uh, uh, Pacific Coast Highway, PCH. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 I think it's just called Route 1. We did not because oh. Sean was a little too concerned about Route 1 being small, you know, and having less stuff. So we didn't, we didn't go I, I don't know. I'm sure it's set up for travelers. I'm pretty sure it is. I, yeah, I, I would imagine it would be. But he's, I wouldn't say anxious is the right word, but it's close. He's a very thoroughly concerned person when it comes to possible catastrophes and disasters. Like I built the bus to be able to boondock in it right off the bat. And we did not bother boondocking for any length of time outside of like a day or two here, like, you know, a Walmart, a rest stop, a truck stop, a harvest toast or something for a mm -hmm. couple of days. We didn't even bother to do that until this year. This is the first time we actually went boondocking wow. for like, hey, let's go out for a week. We can do about a week on the water we have. And then we have to go in and find a dump station and a refill. But we can do a solid week too if we have to. Well, have you ever? And we'd never done that. I've I have not traveled the PCH thoroughly, but what I used to do when I lived in LA, I just used to, if I ever had time and like enough gas money and whatever to get, <laughs> to, get to get over and drive to the PCH, I would just drive up there and like maybe go to the beach yeah. and, or go on a hike or something like that. I'd go just, you know, I'd go past Malibu and just keep on going. Cause you're next to all these, like in LA, you got to pay for parking at the beaches. But once you get out oh, yeah. of L once you get out of LA County, like it's all free, like parking and state beaches. And it's just as beautiful. Oh, yeah. And the mountains are next to it. And it is just like, it's amazing. It's a beautiful area. 
Like me, at least what I've seen, and I've heard it just like, it's amazing the whole way. That's all I've heard about the PCH. So. Yeah. We, we were on parts of it here and there, and it is beautiful. Like when you can stay really close to the coast it's beautiful. Uh, we did hit Crescent city, which was lovely. That had some really, really beautiful views. Mm. Basically. I mean, just the whole coast is beautiful. The sand gets softer, the farther North you go. I will say that the farther North really. Yeah. Manzanita. Um, which is not that far from Portland as the crow flies. And that was very soft sand. I went barefoot there all the time. People looked at me like I was insane. I think it was November or something, October, November. I was running around barefoot and they were just like, and I'm like, I'm from New Hampshire. The water is always this cold. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't care. I'm at the beach. I'm going barefoot. <laughs> so yeah, the dog loved it too. Oh all dogs love beaches all dogs love beaches beautiful beach there uh, we stayed there for like two weeks had one of the worst leaks in the entire bus but man it was <laughs> the beach every day every time it stopped raining we would run to the beach it was really gorgeous there so yeah we basically just followed the ocean all the way down to san francisco so that's the farthest south i think we got on that side was san francisco which we had to park well outside of San Francisco. <laughs> That's another place where you almost cannot park. It was really busy. Um, stayed in Pleasanton. It was beautiful. And then we, gosh, Pleasanton was Christmas. So we were in Pleasanton and San Francisco for Christmas. And then we basically headed back towards the desert, sort of. We went to Bakersfield after that because we needed a PM on the bus and uh, Bakersfield is boring. I would not recommend it. I've, I've been to <laughs> Bakersfield a couple of times. Uh, it's a tiny little piece of the Midwest. It's just, just a little flat farmland. It's the most, uh, it's of the major cities in California. I think it's the most normal. <laughs> oh, it's very normal. Yeah. So yeah, Horrendously that was normal. still when <laughs> COVID stuff was happening and man, people in Bakersfield did not care. Yeah. They were so yeah. done with it. I, I, of course, I'm, I'm here in Utah, and there's a whole lot of, a uh, whole lot of, let's say, California judgment. But I mean, every time I go over there, it's like, it's just an it, California is quite normal outside of the two major, major hubs. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know, I love that state. Um, I lived uh, in it for a couple of years. It's I was... a beautiful state. <laughs> it's just a shame the people running it. <laughs> I'm not. Well, we can't get into that on this on this show um no, uh, it's fine there are good people it's it's just man the gas is so expensive oh my gosh yeah the Whew. gas is the gas is horrendous it went up a right buck now 50 just crossing the border <laughs> about fell out of my chair i was like oh my god but <laughs> gotta go to the arcos just to see it gotta go to the arcos you gotta use debit go to the arcos they're they're cheaper um i mean not much, not enough. <laughs> yeah, not, no, not when you immediately cross into Nevada and Arizona and you're like, what happened? Why is it so much cheaper like, over here? <laughs> I feel like I've just, I've gained money just crossing the border. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> Saved a hundred dollars. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, so you've gone and now you're, you're back here. Yeah. Um, we went through Bakersfield. We did Joshua tree. Love Which Joshua Tree. Was so fun for reasons I had no idea. It's those rocks, man. It's cool. Oh, so much bouldering. We did so much bouldering. It's cool. I have like some of my favorite photos I've ever taken have been in Joshua Tree. It's like it's impossible not to take a like, good photo in Joshua Tree. Right. Just because the environment is so bizarre. Um, really cool spot. It is really cool. I, I would highly recommend going there with gloves. With gloves, what, what did you yeah, do? Yeah, man, those bouldering, uh, lots of rock climbing. We we climbed all, but like anything we could climb, we were all over it. It was like a adult jungle gym. It was so much fun. That's a good way to describe. Yeah, good, good chunk. And of Joshua Tree. We realized that Coachella was a real place. Oh, <laughs> we had no idea. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, you just don't know. There are all these things that we didn't realize were real places until we traveled to them. Like, oh my gosh, Coachella is a real place. Because, you know, we looked at it like Lollapalooza. Like, it's just a name somebody gave a festival. Like, I heard, no, it was named after a real place. I heard about Joshua Tree for years. One of the things about Joshua Tree is like, that's a place where like a lot of people do put up like tiny homes and stuff. Because it's like, 
one of the most like D rate as far as like home building, one of the most deregulated yeah. areas of California, like Ooh. by a lot, like way more, way less regulation than there is like here. Like I can't just go out and build a tiny home in the desert and live in it, but apparently near Joshua tree, not in Joshua tree, but near Joshua tree. Oh yeah. You can yeah. do that. And like some like rock stars have like these crazy homes out there and stuff like that. You got to get through on a dirt road and. Uh, yeah. It's really interesting. It's spot. like I... utter chaos out there. <laughs> Yeah, bunch of hippies. <laughs> great, great area for hippies is uh, the jo- uh, the surrounding area of Joshua Tree. Yeah, it warms my libertarian soul. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah, I love that area so much. I, I, I want to go back to it like right now. Like I. <laughs> yeah, I have a real weak spot for just the Mojave Desert in general. Probably because of fallout. Frankly, yeah, yeah, you don't want to know games. how many times I said, you know, how many times I quoted fall. <laughs> I Here's the thing that I was surprised by. So my entire life, I always wondered about, like, why is this the Great Basin Desert? Why is that the Mojave Desert? Uh, Colorado Plateau. I don't know if that's the desert, yeah. but whatever. It is desert. Yeah. Um, what I, uh, it was at Joshua Tree that I read one of the plaques and what it said was, was that, it's just the it's just the flora and fauna that differentiate the yeah. deserts and i was like what that's it so it really it's is just what grows there it is just one big desert i'm like what scientist or uh geographer decided these were different deserts like it's just one big desert and yet i had yeah. the same question because you know we went through <laughs> big bend which was my first like real desert you know i'd never mm. really been to a desert before i'd been to colorado briefly but it didn't count and i'm like seeing all of these i learned a lot of the different plants i'm finding that in the desert it's a lot easier to recognize plant life i think because it just has less plant life um and they're easier to differentiate the very slight differences because well i mean oh what are they called there's cholla and there's like 10 different kinds of cholla but they're all cholla to start with so it's very easy to differentiate them so i was seeing like things that I had seen in Big Bend, but I was seeing it in Joshua Tree and in the Mojave, you know, and in the Sonoran Desert. And I'm like, what's the difference? And yeah, I, the exact same thing. Like I couldn't figure it out until the plaque at Joshua Tree. I'm like, oh, oh, that's the difference. Well, that's a terrible difference. <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> Who thought that was a good idea? Just call it like the Great West U.S. Desert or something. It's all the same. It's just a big yeah. dry area. It's huge. Yeah. Well, they're like four <laughs> main deserts, and even in those, they have like subgroupings of yeah, deserts. And I'm just do. like, oh my god, they why? <laughs> I th- <laughs> why? Uh, I thought it was cool. I just learned something like that should have been totally obvious my entire life when I was. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, of course. That's why this is the Mojave Desert. It's not because of like oh, precipitation. Just to a trees. Okay. There you go. There you go. It's almost entirely because of the Joshua trees. And that's in that area with the crazy like cactus field. Um, yeah. Nah. Joshua tree has the cho- the big cholla field. Yeah. That was awesome. Great pictures. Uh, I think that was the teddy bear cholla. <laughs> great. Great pictures there. I also found a, uh, when I went there where there was a, there was a desert tortoise crossing the road. Ooh. that was that was uh one of the highlights of my entire life i think it's actually seeing a desert tortoise yeah. in the wild ish i know there was a road going through it but it was crossing the Still. road and then like just like standing next to the tortoise as it was crossing the road so that people wouldn't run it over um yeah. that was ah, that was just cool It was cool seeing that tortoise just like chilling <laughs> yeah it's just i had a I think the closest I've come to desert wildlife that was very exciting was the coyote that almost crossed the road in front of the bus. I think it was a young coyote. And I almost hit it. It looked so surprised to see me there. And I'm like, you're crossing a highway here, my friend. (laughs) So that was really exciting. I've seen a coyote once in my life. And it was in, it was like just above Salt Lake City. There's like a, there's the Bonneville Trail that crosses into Salt Lake City. And, uh, there was like an, like, a I I did like a eight mile section that went from like North Salt Lake into Salt Lake, but went over the mountain basically. And that thing scared the crap out of me. It like <laughs> came out of the bushes and like ran past me. And I, I was terrified. And then I had also seen all these signs up there saying like, beware of bears and stuff like that. I had no idea oh, that the God, area yeah. just above the Salt Lake 
just above Salt Lake was so wildlife heavy, but uh, it was the only oh. time I've I've heard coyotes a lot. I've never I'd never seen one, and it was just one too. And I know they're in packs, so that I I was like looking around, like <laughs> is today gonna Where be the they? day? Where are they? Yeah, I, I, if I'm not in a group, if I'm just hiking alone, I become like a, I, I just become a baby up in the mountains when I see. <laughs> I mean, you know, there are big cats start, that would just love to eat you for yeah, dinner. Yeah, and then I start just making lots of noise because that's what you're told to do. You know, annoy them. Mm, long. So they go pig. away. <laughs> Basically. Um, I, yeah. So, uh, if you could give me like a top, what are your top three? places that you've been to finger lakes big bend yellowstone solid choice definitely yeah um and uh for anybody out there like what what do you have to be ready for to live this lifestyle like who would you recommend it to and who would you recommend it not to who would you not recommend it to in order to enjoy this lifestyle, you have to be able to live with less. You have to be very flexible in changing your plans. And uh, having a little money in the bank isn't going to hurt either. Because when things go wrong, they cost money and they're expensive. <laughs> um, about speaking of New Jersey, uh, when we were there, we ran out of diesel. That's when I found out that the uh, gas gauge on the bus does not work, which mm. I should have known because that's happened with like half of the cars I've owned. You got a curse. And that costs us about a thousand dollars not to fix. It was the tow, getting it towed to a oh. place that could fix it. Getting it fixed was like a hundred bucks to have the guy reprime the thing because um, a gas get on the gas filter was bad, but the tow was like $800. Oof. So Things cost money. It gets really expensive. Honestly, I would recommend it to anybody. One of the biggest things I hear out here is, oh, wow, man, you're living the dream. And, and Shvam hears the same thing every time people ask him about it when he's on you know, meetings and stuff. They're like, oh, where are you guys now? Oh, man, I wish I could do that. You can do it. You just have to decide to do it and do the work. And it's, it's kind of scary because you're un- you're ungluing yourself from the life you've always lived. It's kind of a big leap, but I think anybody who does a little bit of research knows what they're getting into can do this and live this lifestyle. Um, we stay in RV parks most of the time and that costs about the same as our mortgage. And if we want to save money, we can boondock and it costs so much less. Mm -hmm. The technology is there to make this easy. You've got hot spots, you've got solar panels, we've got lithium batteries, we've got, you know, rechargeable everything now, you know, lights and walkie talkies and iPads and phones, everything has a battery now. It's the easiest time ever to live this lifestyle. You just have to get out of your comfort zone and do it. You just do. And, and that's, that's the hardest part is just realizing um, something that helps Shavam again, because he gets really worried about the possibility of disaster, is he has to remind himself there were crazy people back in the 1800s crossing this country with like a couple of horses and they would make it. You know, there, there were these people that would do this stuff, especially uh, early car trips that people would take back when the car was very, very young in the teens. People would do these crazy things like driving across Russia, or driving across the US when there weren't even roads. And they made it. They did it. You know, if they could make it, we can make it in this crazy world that has everything we could possibly need not that far away. We live in a very civilized world. Most of the U.S. is set up for travel. You just take basic precautions and you can do it. You know, if this is a dream, do it. There's never been a better time, especially post-COVID with remote work being so available to a lot of people. Man, there's no better time to do this. And it's 100% worth it. Well, there you go, guys. 
uh thank you so much for coming on to the show uh please uh feel free to send us your comments questions about uh backpacking or travel cool outdoor stories uh or ideas for future episode topics uh if we think it'll bring value to our audience we'll read it on the show and you can send those by commenting on our live ultralight podcast youtube channel or you can uh or you can send us an email at live ultralight podcast at gmail.com guys remember to send in your itunes reviews we'll read those on the show and uh, please subscribe on itunes spotify youtube or wherever you get your podcasts and go check out the schoolie diaries uh <laughs> and uh, uh once again thank you for for coming on the show oh, of course my pleasure